thank you, Dr. Vardy, thank you, Marcel, thank you, Steffi, thank you, Heiko. Um, today we're here to talk about storytelling. And uh, let me bring on stage some very accomplished and very diverse international storytellers. Here is Loic Lemur, here is Oraito, Fernando Sulicin, and Julia Allison. Ito? Right. I gotta sit there. Sorry. <laughs> That's what they told me. Um, well, let us start off um, by asking you a question. Whose life here has been affected by one story that's special, that means something to you, that considers to affect you today? I guess the answer is probably everyone. So that's uh, what we're here to talk about. It's stories, because stories unite us. They bring us together across borders and boundaries. And it's the oldest form of human communication, because um, back in the day of cavemen, they were drawing pictograms in damp caves. And um, today we have the internet to tell stories, and this is um, why we're all here together to discuss that. Um, because what has remained over this evolution is um, that everybody likes to hear a story, and many people like to tell stories because they make us cry, they make us laugh, and uh, they evoke emotions, and we feel. And um, so we're very fortunate to have um, this panel of great storytellers here. And um, let me just very quickly tell you something about us at The Crane TV, because uh, we're launching in March and we are um, a platform that provides those who tell their stories through art with a big um, platform to do so and to tell their story. And um, here we go, this is, uh, this is us. There's no sound. Thank you. Um, so this is just a quick sneak preview of uh, what's going to be there in March, and we've set up a special page, dld.thecrane.tv, and uh, you can all register your email address there, and you'll be invited to our private beta launch in March, um, which would be very exciting. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, so um, I hope you will come there, because um, currently we're also launching a video competition where we have some other great storytellers, uh, like Karl Lagerfeld, Flavio Albanese, Kirill Razlogov, Laurent Clacquin, and uh, two of those great storytellers are here today with us as well, Fernando and Ito. So let me um, allow the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, here's uh, a big welcome to Loïc Lemeur. Hello everyone, so my name is, uh, I don't have a mic, yeah? Hi, yes, my name is Loïc. Loïc Lemur, and you can find me everywhere on uh, LOIC, twitter.com slash LOIC, or sysmic.com slash LOIC. Let me do a quick experiment just to introduce how cool it is to tell a story here, uh, you know. Hi, Sysmic friends. Uh, I'm here at DLD just on stage trying to, you know, tell a story, and let me show you the, uh, the room, if I don't unplug any cables. We have a full room here. Hey, say hi to Sismic over there and Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And, um, and so uh, the panel is storytelling. What is it for you to tell a story? Can you reply? And we'll show you a few, we'll show a few replies on stage. So um, this is just recording right now. And the reason why we launched Sismic is to make it extremely easy to tell a story online. So, uh, so from the DLD stage. So I just put, <laughs> so I just put this. Now it's online, and uh, it should be. It's also uh, it should also uh, be on uh, on Twitter posted here, 
as you see. So this is Twill, which is a, a tool, TWH IRL, which got 700,000 downloads, and which is a great way to uh, use Twitter, but also tell stories on Twitter, but also tell stories now in video on Sysmic, and we repost them to, uh, uh, to Twitter as well, and Facebook and other social software. And as you can see, it's very easy. But what I want to give you is a few examples and uh, stay in my two, two, three minutes. And then we'll see if we get replies in that time frame. You can even reply from the room if you like. But uh, basically, if I find my uh, delicious, just a few examples. Uh, here we have, um, so <laughs> probably the best, uh, the best storyteller of uh, DLD, <laughs> who uh, is launching a catastrophe conference. Yesterday, who, uh, I don't know if we have sound. Can we have the sound up of um, And you see, you're so popular, and you have so many friends around the world that they, they'd love to see you. So what was it about Burning Man that you told yesterday, that you were, it was about art? It was a conference. I wanted to say that it's the best conference in the world. Of course. No. How is your... Uh, I and to we also willing to give a trial period. You can give our credit card for your credit card for 30 days and if you don't like So anyway, he's explaining he's launching a catastrophe conference. That's one uh, way of telling stories, which is, I think, very cool. Um, an example with the BBC and how they use uh, Sysmic to tell their, uh, their stories. As you can see, uh, the BBC has uh, uh, content which they put uh, specifically for, uh, for Sysmic and which they push also on uh, on, um, on Twitter as well, so if you uh, click on one, if we can have the sound. Have your say. I'm Susanna and I just wanted to thank you again for all the brilliant videos that you've been sending in on how to have a DIY Christmas on a budget. We've already featured some of your videos on BBC World News, so check them out on the so link. So this was for the Obama, for example. Hello to everybody on Seismic, I'm Jamila from BBC Have Your Say and Happy New Year to you all as well. On Tuesday, Barack Obama is going to be sworn in as the U.S. president, and, and we'd like to... So that's nothing uh, if I don't show you the replies, and what's new here is we c you can have a story. So what they do is they ask people what they think about Obama inauguration, and you can see they got 25 replies. So when you click here, you get, a, uh, you get all the replies of everybody, which is, uh, which is um, something I think which is very new. It's like crowdsourced video replies, and what they do is... Thank you. And you can browse through everybody replying from all around the world to this question. And they post a lot of questions. What they do is then they do a mashup of those videos. So they got like what people think about Obama inauguration from Australia, from Japan, from everywhere in the world. And they aired them on TV. And that's, I think, a great way to get our stories, you know, us, not journalists, not being famous TV stars and so on online. I'm al almost done. This is Frida Walden. She has posted 17,000 videos on Seismic. So she <laughs> she's uh, our star and she knows uh, how to uh, cl cl clearly how to uh, uh, post uh, you know, our stories. So we have here, uh, as you can see, a few replies. But now I'm out of time, so I don't want to... Uh, Rodrigo here from the room has actually posted a video uh, replying to us. And uh, yeah, so that's Seismic, which I think is a great way to, uh, to post uh, stories online. And uh, I will uh, just end here by uh, the fact that I think now if you look at the future, not talking about Sysmic, but you probably all remember this uh, US uh, 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 airplane that crashed, that landed on the water um, near New York. And this is a great, uh, I think, story, which is told entirely in pictures and using tweets and using videos from all services, this, you know, not, not, not only, not actually not Sysmic. But you can see step by step, and the story started on, on Twitter, actually, and ended up, I think it's CNN over there, so on TV, but later. And I think it's, there's an entire new world around conversation, which is growing right now, and which is very interesting. That was uh, my introduction. Heiko? Sorry? Off you go, Julia. <laughs> the clock Hi. isn't working. Um, so I don't know who knows who I am here. I'm a media personality in the U.S., which, which is to say that um, I do a variety of things, including traditional television like on CNN, MSNBC, VH1, uh, traditional print journalism, and then my new company, which is Non-Society. And I'm going to show you a short video segment uh, from a company called Better TV that I hope describes it in a way that is intelligible and entertaining. Hmm. 
putting your whole life online for the entire world to see, becoming famous on the internet just for being you, having thousands of people log on daily to follow your every move. Well, it's an everyday reality for the girls of non-society, and we met up with them in Manhattan to get a real-life peek into their online world. One, two, three, go! Go, 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 It's for sure! <laughs> Meet the girls of non-society, Time Out New York dating columnist Julia Allison, handbag designer Mary Rambin, and former hedge fund analyst Megan Asha. Three, two, action. So how do you handle holiday plans with your significant other? Together, these three web stars have pushed the boundaries of blogging and turned it into a whole new art form they call life casting. The big joke amongst bloggers is, oh, you don't want to blog what you ate for lunch. Well, maybe you do, actually. That's our thinking. We think that those sorts of things can be really interesting. You know, what are you wearing? Um, where are you going this evening? Go to the Non-Society website and you'll see the girls' lives unfold online, often in real time. They talk about dating, dieting, their dogs. They take readers behind the velvet ropes of exclusive parties or just along for dinner. We follow them to Mercado 55 in New York's meatpacking district as they blogged their meal. Cheers. <laughs> Nothing like a long, Great long day. day to finish it off with a glass of champagne to toast our life casting accomplishment. <laughs> life casting. So what exactly is life casting? Well, think of it as having three glamorous girlfriends sharing their most intimate secrets to their closest 20,000 friends each day. Very first person, very personality driven, very, very new media. We have this ability to publish instantly on a global basis just about anything. It's really going to be the next generation online first person magazine. They update dozens of times a day so fans are always clued in and three times a week they host an internet chat show they call TMI as in too much information. I think don't date a guy if he doesn't speak to his parents. That's I'm really sorry scary. that's just done. There's nobody censoring us except for ourselves and we're speaking directly and honestly to the people who want to listen. And not only are they listening, but they're very engaged. Each girl has a specialty, dating, tech, or fashion, but they aren't afraid to veer off topic and have fun, like when they film what they call lip dubs. I want candy. It's a music video for those who can't sing. And they're not afraid to poke fun at themselves either. This is what happens when it's lip a dub. lip dub gone wrong. But there is a dark side to live casting. Last year, Julia lost her boyfriend after blogging the intimate Didn't details of their relationship. Me. She believes it's their audience who ultimately caused the breakup. And it turns out when you break down the fourth wall, the wall between you and the audience, and they start to in interact with you, it can actually change what happens, which, boy, that can be extremely dicey. It also has, you know, to a certain extent, ruined my personal life. The girls admit putting themselves out there for public critique can be disheartening at times. I actually still struggle with that. I'm like, okay, well, where, like, how much is too much? And oh my God, some days I feel so exposed. You think, God, why am I even doing this if people are gonna be so cruel? They would never be that cruel to your face. But behind the safe walls of their computer screen, they don't mind. But they say for every hate email, there's many more who appreciate their efforts. I do get a lot of readers who will write to me and say, thank you so much for doing that because no one else is talking about this and you made me feel less alone. And for that reason, the girls say they will continue live casting for the foreseeable future. It's offered me incredible opportunities. It's also come with huge disadvantages. That's just life. So, how do I toggle my mentally disabled? What do I, how do I, do? oh, the next one? Okay, so you can see, we, we actually have been live blogging throughout this. You can see there's a, I actually just blogged that from my phone. I can do it instantly. Um, and I think the coolest thing about what we're doing, which is a, it's a totally new way of telling stories. And it's something that I, we've called it live casting because blogging is such an, it's such an ugly word, really. And, the thing that we really focus on is that it's chronological, it's real time. It's also first person. It's myself and my two best girlfriends. And something that you don't see in ordinary media and traditional journalism is this ability to look into people's lives. And it's something that captures people. And frequently what we'll get, we'll get these questions, is, uh, we'll talk to them, is what is this? What is this? Is this like a blog? Like what is this? It's like walking into a conversation midway through or walking into a soap opera midway through. You're like, 
what's going on here. But it captures the people who uh, are into it. They know the characters just the way you would know your friends' lives. So it's something that you might not understand immediately, but it becomes extremely addictive. And uh, we, we focus on intermittent reinforcement by updating at random interval intervals throughout the day, which means that people check in three, four, five, seven times a day, which, you know, as any of us who are involved in internet companies, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about uh, this more throughout the conversation, but that, that is non-society and live casting. So when did you start your uh, site? So well, <laughs> we'll just do our own little panel yeah. over here. So while go ahead. So explain. So when did you sound? start? Um, well, I started it about. Uh, yeah, let's see. No we. Sound. I started blogging originally using the ugly word blogging. Um, it like six years ago. And hi, seismic people. Yeah, I'm putting you as well. <laughs> um, and then we launched our site um, back in I guess July. So it's not that long ago. So how, me, video is very tough to monetize, right? So how do you plan to well, have you raised? Oh, yeah, and you go right to the monetization question. Of course, Thanks. everybody's asking, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think of it as like, you know the old school radio where they had sponsors, it's like sponsored by Colgate. Right. So that's, that's what we're going to do. S-A-P. Right, exactly. Like, oh, one of our sponsors is Kodak, actually. Um, and uh, Cisco is another sponsor that we deal with. And one of the things that is really important to us is because we're using our real lives. Um, just tell me when to shut so up. So they, they don't care about traffic or anything like that? No, no, we have good traffic, like relatively good traffic. Um, we, we just hit like 800,000 unique. Cool. views um, a month, so that's exciting. But, but one of the things that we do is um, we integrate the products into the storyline. One of the things that I'm really interested in, um, there's a new book out called Biology, B-U-I-ology, um, and uh, the author talks a lot about um, which marketing is super effective, and one of the techniques that he talks about is the marketing um, that is the most effective is marketing that is integrated yeah. into the storyline. So he uses American Idol as an example. Um, there are three main sponsors for American Idol. There's Ford, there is um, obviously Coca-Cola, and then there's uh, like T-Mobile. Um, or I think it's T-Mobile. Is that American? Can you define right? storytelling? What is it for you? What are you just gonna? No, no, I'm just like. This is part, this is, you asked me how I'm monetizing, and I'm going to tell everyone how okay. to do this. Okay, we're so ready here. Oh, we're on. Oh, so ready. you're not, actually. Yeah, next I'm time. not going to do that. <laughs> Check so out really the book. I really want to do that, to know how, to, how you monetize. We're winging it here. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Oraito. Thank you for helping you. me during this hard time. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks. And um, actually, I start... Um, in uh, 1997 by creating the first uh, virtual brand. So it was a brand, but you cannot touch the product, you can just see through the internet. And uh, after I pirate some brand also, like the Louis Vuitton backpack, but without asking um, the brand. And it becomes like one of the most famous uh, back from uh, Louis Vuitton because um, it had a lot of publication and people thought it was existing so Japanese people were going in front of the shop asking for the bag and actually the Chinese people they really produce it so it's not virtual at all <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so that's how I start my career and I did that things to many other brands like Apple like Gucci like 
and they all thought it was really the, like for example, I've been invited by Mr. Big, you know, the big, the lighter, because there is a guy, his name is Mr. Big, like the big, and he owns the company and he received like a big order from the Gary Lafayette of 3,300,000 3, briquet big, but he couldn't deliver. So um, he wanted to know who's the guy who, who did that things. And, and so I realized there is a guy whose name is big. Uh, so um, today I have a design studio working on multidisciplinary. So um, as you see, there is some kitchen. There is almost, I've designed almost everything, every typology from, um, oh, that's the Gucci Villa, it was a big G. Because at this time, Gucci was making so many G things that I was trying to find a packaging where to find all these G things, where to put them actually. And so um, as I was telling you, um, this is the showroom Toyota. That's a funny story also because they thought I was Japanese because my name is Ohaito and it's in Champs-Élysées. I'm a very lucky guy. And um, they did a competition, uh, but uh, when the discover was not Japanese, um, they said, okay, you won, but please don't tell that you're not Japanese. I said, it, was, it will be very difficult, you know. <laughs> Okay, I think I can sit now because um, we're going to talk all together and I think it's going to be much more interesting. But um, um, can I show audio? Yeah. yeah? Um, I've just done, because design, it's, it's about form and shape and materials, but uh, I think the web is like a new weapon also for design and, and design. A good design is always a good idea, so I created a, a website uh, with some friend because... Um, um, so we connected, it, it's called Audio, and uh, we have connected all the biggest club in the world live. So you can listen from your house, from all over the world, all this big club from um, Murano, Baropen, Melbourne, New York, Zebulon, Zanzibar, Bombay, and with the different hours, you have 24 hours music. So if you're living somewhere which is not cool, I think we save your life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fernando. Fernando. Ah, I forgot to see. Espera. Pulsa acá y empieza. ¿Dónde? Y empieza. Mira acá en Tun. Hello. Tun. Hello, I'm Fernando Sulichin and I'm a traditional movie producer. Um, I produce movies and documentaries, so I'm a storyteller in the traditional way of a storytelling that I tell them visually in a traditional form. And I also, part of my other work is to, to work telling stories of politicians or demythifying, which is another way of traditional storytelling, and I do that in in several countries. Um, I have produced uh, basically many different films. Um, do we have the... Yeah, I'll take the mic back and then we'll do it. Okay. Can you break it up? Okay. Since I'm around 20, I don't have but to tell stories. It was pretty much a little bit a, a part of my destiny. I have, and my speciality is to produce very difficult storytellers, such as Abel Ferrara, Spike Lee, Oliver Stone, and most of the people that people don't want to work with because they're difficult. Uh, I take them on. Uh, I take money from people and I convert them into Sometimes things that nobody understands and sometimes things that people cry or, you know, but that's what I do for a living, you know, and if you guys want to invest in some of my movies, you're welcome. <laughs> so that's mostly it of what I do and what, what I came to the world to do. I don't have, you know, I, I'm unuseful to make anything else but this. So thank you very much for being here and 
Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Um, so as you can see, we have a, a very diverse range of storytellers from all walks of life and indeed many different countries all around the globe. So um, I think a first interesting question would be uh, to find out what makes a good story. Fernando, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I think that the most important thing about storytelling is to have a good story. And wh what makes a good story for me, it's a good story. And there you have it. <laughs> I could have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, what do you think? Well, I, you know, I, I have to say, I, I owe you a big thank you because um, I don't think that I had the, the words to describe exactly what it is that I was doing prior to the storytelling. And I was explaining to people, I'm on the storytelling panel, and the look was sort of like, of course, you know, you're like, 12 years, 12, 12, 12 years old, and, and, um, and you're, you, know, you clearly can't be in anything serious. I don't know how you guys got what the reactions were to you, but storytelling, in my opinion, is something that doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's not dependent upon what you think is a quote unquote good story or not. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would come to my website and think this is not a very good story. But we're interested in people's lives inherently. That's you know, a, a human characteristic. And we want to know what's happening. And I, I know as a journalist, sometimes I, I find, frequently I find, you know, myself saying the, the cliche, there's no way you could make this shit up. And the truth is that happens to me all the time. And, and in fact, um, sharing my own, using myself as a guinea pig for this story has been painful in some ways. But I mean, you know, it, it does require um, <laughs> very little imagination because you're just going from your own experience. So, um, I mean, I guess we all know that the internet has, has vastly changed the distribution of stories and, and their reach. Um, do you think that, uh, Ito, for example, your, your story would have been possible in, in the time before the internet, which is only just 15 years ago? Uh, no, not at all. Because um, when I, I, I can say that it's uh, exhausted by the technology in a way. Because if I didn't get the, the, the software to make 3D and I didn't, couldn't use internet, then nobody would have been... Yeah, I would have been to China maybe to, to make it real. <laughs> and it would be like a, a, not the same story. So, um, yes, yeah, thanks to technology. So what, what, are, what are the key elements? Because, I mean, Fernando's obviously telling is in a traditional form of storytelling. Luik, you have... Um, you have individuals from all walks of life on, on Seismic that tell their stories. What, what do you find are, are the stories that, that come up on top um, on, on Seismic? What, what makes them special? <laughs> you know, what we do is we, we have them bubble up. So we have like an active conversation uh, theme there where you have the, most, the highest number of replies, mm -hmm. for example. And I think that's the, like you can see on Twitter, it's the same. It's like what's the success of just like a tweet is how many people retweet it, right? Or reply to it and how it spreads. And I think it's a good uh, way to see if a story spreads or not, to see if it's, uh, if it's good or not. If you're boring, generally nobody talks about it. So it's, it's like it spreads very fast or people reply a lot. So for example, on Sismic, we had, a, uh, we had tons of stories, but we had one which, uh, which was very, uh, very interesting. I think someone started a, uh, an art exhibition which was entirely uh, in video. And okay. it's something I had never seen before. I wanted to show you, but uh, I didn't take the time. And basically, it, it was all about telling a story just using video and, uh, and, and showing different shapes as you were telling the story. And there were like hundreds, 
of replies from all around the world. And uh, that made it very interesting. What made it interesting, pretty much like the comments about Obama inauguration, is that when you have suddenly someone from Australia replying to someone from Germany, replying to you know, someone from the US and so on, it, it's amazing. We had a uh, Iraq soldier uh, video blogging every single day from a camp in Iraq with replies from China, from the US, from Europe, and that just never happened before, and they're all sharing stories. And uh, I, so I think the two, so to answer your point, what makes a good story for me is the, uh, how it spreads or not by the number of replies. I think it's the best, uh, best one, and now it's very international, and that changes totally, also very human. I think that that's a point that could be very dangerous because sometimes we have a lot of marketing around spreading a story and marketing not necessarily makes a good story or a moving story and and that you can see in movies for example now you have like a lot of movies are extremely bad but they're extremely well marketed and they win Oscars and they're nominated for many things but here I'm talking about the internet spreading and it. the internet it's fantastic because it's really communicating by people yeah. and not by marketing oh okay so we agree <laughs> <laughs> if I may, one thing to Louis, uh, I think that you're talking about that's so interesting to me is this transition from one to many storytelling, so broadcast or film, where we're, you know, one person is creating the story and then a, a host of different people are absorbing it. Now we have many to many communication, which obviously wasn't prior to the internet even possible. And I talk about it in there as breaking down the fourth wall. And it's something that's really changed. I know um, uh, between my, my best friends, my business partners and myself, it's changed our lives because you're creating a story but then people are interacting. In fact, I got emails from people at the DLD conference. We were live, you know, life casting it, um, you know, saying like, well, you know, I didn't like this part of your coverage and I didn't like that. And, I, you know, people always write in negative stuff. Like, and. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't ask your opinion, but just by putting up that story, by definition, people assume that they have a right to comment and engage in that story. It's a totally new type of storytelling. So, so the internet basically brings an element of, of because yesterday I heard from, from Facebook that there must have been a poll about whether Facebook friends in different countries would go to war against each other. Um, and you, you all can obviously guess the answer. Um, so, so would you would you all agree that um, the internet basically promotes just greater transparency, um, and and therefore also filters out marketing messages or potentially bad political messages, like Fernando was alluring to before. And I think an important question is: Do you have a res you, as for instance, as somebody a distributor of of all these individual stories? Do you have a responsibility to filter them? Well, you know, we had a. Uh we had a, uh, so I think this video is interesting and seismic as well, in the fact that you meet, it's human. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a campaign that Cisco has, the human network, and I, I love it because it's what I'm trying to do is to have, you know, like to, to meet you. And when it's only by text on Facebook, for example, you don't know each other that mm -hmm. much. And so I met trolls. Right, you have trolls on text, you know, like, like polluting your blog comments. They're a pain. It's terrible. And suddenly you see them show up in video. And we had a guy um, uh, two weeks ago called Igor the Troll. I shouldn't advertise him actually. He showed up on Sismic with uh, two knives and talking about children in Israel. Right, and I won't quote what he said. And we took him down immediately. And uh, so when you say, do you have a responsibility to filter? Yes, it's like if you, you know, you, you know, like. It's like if you use this stage to suddenly say, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about any political or, you know, but there is a limit which is very tricky to, uh, to find where you, you really don't want that on your site. And I, I believe that, uh, and actually we have a flagging, so people flag the content, and that video got so much flag that we knew immediately, which is, which is good. But yeah, uh, I mean, not all the stories are... Uh, actually good, good. It's very, I don't know, I would love your take on that, but like the difference between humor and not, right? So for example, someone else, uh, Lauren Feldman, 1948 Media, showed up on Seismic for Christmas <laughs> and he said, uh, Merry Christmas. He, yeah, and he said, here is what we, I'm sorry, I'm into this again, but I'm quoting him now, and uh, here is what we will do to Christians for Christmas. 
and he started, you know, telling a story and, st and scaring everyone in, 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 in the site. And like that spread actually pretty fast, and it, it's still there because it, it was humor. You could, it's so obvious, but um, it's tricky. How do you tell the difference well, between humor and take it down because it's too much? I'll say one of the things that your site does that um, most other sites don't is you have the accountability because you have the face. <laughs> and one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about is um, the, how shall I put this, lack of manners on the internet right now. Um, and and I, I look towards a lot of new media professors and what they're saying about this. And one of the professors that's really stood out in my mind is Clay Shirky. He's a, a professor in New York. And he talks about what happens in the interim period between uh, technology's invention and its integration in society, then there's this period of chaos until it's completely integrated and, um, and uh, people understand how to use it. And this period of chaos frequently is marked by a lot of very bad manners. People don't understand what the rules are. So we, I heard on a panel, I don't remember what panel it was, but someone was talking about you know, basically peeing in your living room, which is exactly how yeah. I feel when people comment. And we actually don't have comments on, on our live cast because I'm simply not convinced that people, given anonymity, mm. um, can be civil human beings. Now, the difference between that and seismic is that, you know, one of the things you don't do in polite society is go up to someone and say, you would be, may maybe you would be shocked at the things that I have heard on the internet, but these people would never come up to me and say, by the way, you're fat and you're vapid and all these things. This doesn't happen. It still happens on the internet. Until we have real names and real accountability and, and things like video, seismic, things, video yeah. you don't, I mean, and you don't have this problem as much. But every single site does. The New York Times, it doesn't matter how vaunted the site is. They have issues. Y you have new issues. Just another one is someone uh, started to, you know, to, to say would commit suicide on seismic. Mm -hmm. And he started recording. And, you know, I don't know why I get into that because we have uh, all those fantastic stories, but <laughs> we are on that, right? But, and you don't know if it's a story or if it's, or if it's true. And suddenly you have the entire community starting to tell you, you know, here is what's happening. And you have this video and you're like, what do I do now? Is this a story or is this, you know, so very, very tricky. Anyway, let's talk about positive stuff. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> bad stuff. There's well lots of good stuff out there too. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, undoubtedly the, the, the biggest challenge of, of a storyteller is to get their audience to listen. Um, because otherwise there's, there's no success. Um, Ito, how, how, did, how did you get um, that great big audience out there that then started to order these Louis Vuitton bags and produce them in China? How did you get them to listen? How did you, how did you reach them? I think I said already, no? <laughs> Actually, it, it was uh, 1999. I was just 20 years old. And um, I really wanted to do things, but it was a kind of ego gratification in a way when you don't have access to something. And so I really wanted to work for those brands because they're telling stories, and I wanted to tell my stories about them. Like, and um, and they didn't let me do because I was sending my portfolio, and they were never answer. So at the end, I said, "Okay, I'm going to tell the story about their story myself." Y you always um, you tell me. Um, Okay, let's forget about it. Um, and then um, I started doing it, but I really didn't know it will, all this will happen. I will be here to talk about it. Uh, I really did it because I liked to, t I was feeling really working for this brand. And then when I put it in internet, it was in a big portal um, as website of the day because I used technology flash, but uh, 11 years ago, so. and. Um, and all the people thought it was existing, so it was between unreal and real. Because in a way, the virtual is a moment of, uh, of the real. And people still loving it because they never get it, you know? And every time you get something, it's not the same. So they always desire this bag. Did you know this bag? Uh, yeah. oh. Even if she didn't. <laughs> I said all the world knows it, so you really know it. And you didn't ever want it to buy it? Um, I don't have any money, so. <laughs> yeah, but you could have called me, you know, internet. And Maybe, uh, there you go. <laughs> okay. And um, that's all, Constantine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to tell us, whatever you want to share. I can talk for hours. Tell us a story. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I was curious because um, in, in your introduction, Julie, you, you, you said that um, your public life has obviously had a big impact on, on your personal life and your relationship uh, ended. So, so it brings up the question, why, why do you let people into your life so much that they participate at that close an angle an with, your, with, your, with your story? It's an experiment. I mean, what I'm doing is, is a huge experiment. And, and, and in a, a great sense, it's, um, it's had some wonderful consequences. For example, I, as a journalist, I, I started out as a columnist, which is, by definition, slightly more personal than the third-person journalism, you know, of covering um, traditional media stories um, without in interjecting yourself as a reporter. Um, that was how I was most comfortable. I, I like talking with people. Um, in an intimate sense, I, I don't have some of the filters that um, normal human beings do. Um, but I found that by talking about my own experiences, I was able to have a um, conversation with readers that I couldn't possibly have if I were just, let's say, interviewing. And I'll give you a very personal example. I posted um, a couple of weeks ago a first-person account of my struggle with bulimia for three years in college. Now, as a traditional journalist, I could have gone out and interviewed a girl who struggled with bulimia. Instead, I chose to talk about it myself. These, are, these were my impressions, and, and um, you know, this was my story. I got hundreds of emails. I mean, the emails I got, ugh, they, were, they were incredible. You would never get emails like that with a third person story. Or, you know what, excuse me, maybe not never, but I have never gotten emails like that with a third person story. And that's something that I'm uniquely able to do by using my own personal experiences. Um, and I, you know, yes, there are consequences, but there are consequences to everything. You know? And I'm not saying that I would you know, necessarily advocate this for everyone, but this is happening. This is going to be a new form of journalism. We just happen to be the first people to do it. So um, this this new form of journalism and 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 storytelling over the internet obviously has has had a big effect on on, on political campaigns. I mean, I think w all of us agree that that the Obama campaign was was hugely influenced in its success through the internet. And and I know that um, all you, all of you have have strong sort of political affiliations. I know Loic is is an advisor to to President Sarkozy. Uh, you have a political sciences degree, and then Fernando obviously is is active in filmmaking in, in Latin America with people like Hugo Chavez and uh, Fidel Castro, and in um, in the Middle East as well. Um, how how do you think um, that that political decision making, important I important stories are, are are driven and affected now by by public scrutiny and and the internet? What what are your experiences, for instance, from the presidential campaign with Sarkozy? Um, I helped a little bit. You you're overstating it by saying I'm, I'm not like busy with my startup now. But I'm got him Wikipedia said you went to the White House with him and were sort of instrumental. I just got but Wikipedia. The <laughs> <laughs> right. The um, I think it's the truth of lies don't survive and um, don't don't do a shortcut to anything I say <laughs> regarding likes and politicians but I think they, uh, they clearly uh, enhance the reality all the time in a way which doesn't survive very well on the internet and and that's I think what's uh, so fascinating for me is that the uh, uh, each time they say something which is not true or which is too you know overstated or which is not they, they immediately there is a conversation which goes everywhere and it ends up on the Wikipedia and so lies don't survive at all in this new world and I, I think it's, uh, it's like the political stories have uh, hard times this day to survive the way they did. I don't know, do you disagree no, with that? I, I think that <coughs> there is a extremely big danger on to use the internet for, for political campaigns because for example they use, there is a lot of media money against certain people and they spread by paying journalists uh, in many, many countries to create one story that is constantly repeat over and over and over to demonize a person over and over and over. So then in those countries, you have a fact that that person, you know, it's blonde and blue eyes, where, where I mean, to, to make a comparison, where the reality and the facts has nothing to do. So the media and the internet is used 
sometimes by people like the random group in the US and other people in a terrible, terrible way to create fantasies that then people buy and then like, for example, like weapons of mass destruction. And then they assume these realities because it's in the internet, it's everywhere and, and there is so little time to fact checking. And people assume because it's on the internet, it's in the New York Times, it's in this, it's in that, that that's true. Four years later, they discover that that's a lie and then you have the other way, you know, the other way of regression. So suddenly all this, all this truth becomes a lie. And so I hope that now, especially specifically with Obama, I understand that he has a great story to tell and he's been very constant in telling this story very, very well. Suddenly now everybody is logging in into that story. I hope that they don't over do it, over advertise it, and then they they bring it out immediately, like, you understand? But if you, if you see it from the other side, like, for a few weeks, sorry, Julia. No, no, I just don't know what we're talking about. Anymore. Are we talking about politics? No, we're talking about how okay. media in the sorry. internet, they could okay. demonize someone, and then that situation reverts, you know, and, and they do it on purpose. Rick, go ahead. I mean, I, I worked on political campaigns before I started in journalism, um, back when they weren't at all using the internet, um, back in 2000. And I, I've i seen a, a huge transition, obviously, as we all have, um, in terms of the Obama campaign. But one of the things that, this is a slight shift. Um, I, I don't know if we, I don't, do we really want to get into politics? I, I don't know, do we? It's, Please say no. I think we have questions, so we should. <laughs> I mean, uh, one of the things that I, I think we should really talk about is um, the fact that the internet does something that is very interesting that happens to politicians. If you watch them go from private citizens to actual politicians and get beaten down by the press, they become blander versions of themselves. And I see that that's what's happening right now on the internet with normal human beings. Because one of the interesting things, and I don't hear people talking about this, is that when you interact with other human beings, you, you choose a, a, a persona that you have. It's, it's not fake, but it's the person you are with your boss might not be the person that you are with your boyfriend, might not be the person you are with your parents or with your girlfriends, right? I mean, they're all you, but you conduct yourself differently. Well, you only get one choice on the internet. And politicians, similarly, only get one choice. And I see that happening to people, and it's confusing to them because they say, well, you know, we talk about this in Facebook, for example. Oh, what kinds of pictures are you going to put up on Facebook? Can your boss see them? Can your, you know, all the five women you're dating, can they see them? You know, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is an interesting um, aspect to storytelling because, you know, you said lies don't survive. Well, what if it's not lies? What if it's merely well, the way you act in different situations? Politics is a lot about telling stories, which are uh, the reality in a very enhanced way, I think. So. Maybe it's just being, <laughs> I, I agree with you, but I think that this is something that is going to apply to everyone. You're going to have to choose, you know, who are you going to be in, on this internet? I mean, I know my father reads my website. That's awkward on a host of different levels, you know? But you don't have a choice. Well, you do have a choice. Well, you, you won't because everyone is going to have an internet persona. Now, whether that's the blandest version of yourself possible, this is what happens to politicians. They basically choose the choice that's going to piss off the least number of people, right? I mean, that's what politicians do. That's why they're so goddamn boring, at least in America. If you want to talk about politics, I mean, you, want to you brought it up. Yeah, shall we um, open up some questions? Would you, uh, anybody like to ask a question to one of our panelists? Okay. Yeah, there's like one, yeah. There's a microphone going around. Hi, Lisa Sonia from Helsinki, Finland, and a company called Doppler. I would like to uh, first congratulate Julia of getting 6.3 million hits on Google. Loik, who's pretty famous, you're only getting, uh, getting ni uh, 1.9. Oh, sorry. And op <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm trying to suck less every day. So, uh, Julia, um, <laughs> you're getting very powerful because Oprah is getting 24 million hits and Hillary Clinton, 21 million. So I'm asking, uh, you certainly helping people to have better sex and parties, but do you have other ambitions? <laughs> and in what way you would like to use your power to help women to get you ahead in power. life? There we go. 
that, that goes back to the responsibility issue. I don't, I don't know if I'm really helping anyone have better sex, at least of all myself, but... Um, uh, oh, tell I, us about that. I don't have any sex ever. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Um, okay, so this is a great question, and one of the things that I'm really focused on doing in, in the coming years is, I, and we talked about this in the panel, the Women Power panel, young women, and this is slightly different, I'm sorry, young women don't tend to start uh, businesses. Um, it, I don't know why. It, it didn't occur to me for a long time. Um, I see it as a huge issue in, in terms of where we're going in technology. I will tell you, I, the shit I get, <laughs> you, um, no wonder women don't put themselves out there. Um, you know, when you go online and you do your seismic videos, people probably don't email you that you are fat. I'm just guessing. Or maybe they do. Fat? Yeah, exactly. This is this is what happened. So I would love for one of the issues that I would love to address. I get that a little bit actually. Not <laughs> yeah, you can't. You don't get that, right? No, I get it all the time. That all you're the fat? Time. Yeah, all the time. Really? And, or you're, you know, on a, you're old. That's another one. Um, so I think that you know, just simply by, you know, talking about the fact that young women don't put themselves out there, talking about the fact that, um, you know, in terms of so how many story how many requests a day do you get for you know someone who wants to date you? For example, every day. No one wants to date me. No, but like, like, <laughs> like fans, you know, Lloyd, men who Lloyd, you know, Lloyd, are dreaming you're about being. my question. Sorry. Shut up! I have a question to you <laughs> later. How are you gonna make the world better place? <laughs> <laughs> I shut up. I, it, the number one thing that is that is most concerning to me right now is the fact that women are told that. There's this false dichotomy. You can either be interested in fashion, in makeup, in boys, or you can be interested in physics, in engineering, in um, feminist rights, and I am interested in both. And I think that, um, you know, my appearance may belie that, and I, I apologize for liking um, to, to dress in, you know, cute outfits. It doesn't mean I'm not intelligent. It doesn't mean that I can't, you know, compete with every single one of these guys. Um, I wouldn't necessarily try to make a film, but, you know, goddammit, if I wanted to do it, I would. And I think that young women need to know, they need to know that that's possible. And they need to know it's possible by other young women saying, you know what, uh, my success does not have to come at the expense of yours. It is not a zero sum game. And we should all be in this to support each other. And I am a feminist. Well, yet you, I mean, you put yourself out there very personally. I mean, Ito puts out products, so there's critical acclaim, there's criticism. Some people like it, some people dislike it. Fernando makes movies, tells a story, it's kind of the same thing. And Luik provides a platform, yet, yet you are the one who, who really puts yourself out there as, as, as who you are in your, in your everyday life. And it's not something that is, I mean, you open yourself up to that kind of dialogue with your audience, I guess. Um, because you're not putting out something that is just a product or a platform, but it's it's yourself. So how you? Know. Well, frequently I wish that I w you know I could well, hide are behind. Are you something. are you a product? I, Ito, I don't know if you heard, Ito said she is a product. I mean, it's the reality show without the producer. It's the magazine without the editor. A brand, yeah, exactly. Made yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> made in Chicago, Illinois. Um, yes. And, and obviously that comes with disadvantages, but I will say, as I said before, one of the things that, uh, that does enable me to do is to be intimate with you know, <laughs> millions of people, um, with the way Oprah is, and, and that's, you know, that's my eventual goal. I think that she's able to speak to people. You know, yes, it's really hard sometimes, and it, and it can be embarrassing, and it, there are, that opens me up to judgment, and judgment's a scary fucking thing. Excuse my language, it's scary. And, um, but there's no other way to have that, not no other way, but that's the way I think I can, you know, affect people. Any, any other questions? Seriously? I'm not gonna put this up. Who is this film made? Me? I feel like we're talking about this. Fernando. There's one here. Well, there, what's, what's the next story that's going to be told? I'm gonna tell, in film, I'm going to tell the story of, of Christ as a revolutionary, uh, done by Tim Robbins, who did Dead Man Walking. So, I don't know, I'm into my revolution phase, like, uh, at the moment. In, in documentaries, I'm telling the secret story of America, what, what was not told by the general history, 
you know, what happened after Hiroshima, you know, what really happened. We really go deeper, and we do that with the director Oliver Stone in, in 10 documentaries. And in my life, I don't know. We'll see what next adventure that was we'll a take on. Hey, Gabe Mac. Some of you guys know me. Um, I have a quick question. Are we, you know, just getting a little bit too tied up in the whole idea of technology changing stories? If we look back to a book that was written a little while ago, before Seismic or blogs, it was a collection of stories. A lot of them were based about one guy that were being told from different people, you know, and their experiences with him. And I'm sure you guys know this book. It's pretty popular. It's called The, the Bible. <laughs> and basically, that's what's going on now, except we can just see it. So what would happen if Jesus Christ was a blogger? Exactly. <laughs> I like the way you think. I, I will say one of, the, one of the things, I'm sure you know Rashomon. That's one of um, the movies that inspires me in terms of different perspectives. You're right. It's, they're universals. And, and I don't, were you saying this that, um, just earlier that, you know, this is a new way of telling stories, but it, they're old stories. Things that resonate with people um, on the internet would be the same things that resonate with them if you're sitting in their living room. I mean, they're all, you know, we have human, the same human emotions we were dealing with back when the Bible was written, other ones that we're dealing with now, you know, how to find happiness, how to find love, how to, um, you know, find closure in relationships, you know, all of these things, um, they're constant and, and there are different ways and thank God we have different ways because different sorts of stories de resonate with different sorts of people. I mean, excuse me, different methods of storytelling resonate with different sorts of people. Excellent. Well, um, we're uh, at the end of our session. Thank you all very much for, for coming. Thank you, our thank you. panelists. <laughs>